Not for the first time, and almost certainly not for the last time, today's case sees crime and mental health becoming inextricably linked. A man with a severe case of paranoid schizophrenia crosses paths with a family woman, well liked in her community, and an example of someone with no enemies. Once again, we delve into the question of whether or not someone is responsible for the actions they commit during a mental health crisis. This is Murder of Crows. Today, we're back in my home country of Wales. But it, unfortunately, it's not to extol its virtues as a country of unparalleled beauty, incredible landscapes, friendly people, and a significant number of sheep. Rather, we travel to South Wales to look at an extremely cruel and horrific crime and we will delve into the impact of a mental health condition on the way a person conducts themselves. But first we'll visit the large village where these tragic events unfold. Llantwit Vardra is a large village near Pontypridd in South Wales. It's believed the name Llantwit Vardra is derived from an old Welsh language name, meaning the Church of St Ilted, which is where Llantwit comes from, on the home farm of the Prince, Vairdrev, and relates to the land surrendered to the Prince of the district by his subject to provide him with an income. 
this is a case that is close both geographically and chronologically as it's less than 50 miles from where I sit right now and the sentencing hearing was held on the 28th of April of this year. The facts of the case were pretty clear-cut and the identity of the per perpetrator was known almost from the start of the investigation. But it's yet another case where mental health issues and criminal behaviour are intertwined. As well as being close in terms of date and location, this case is also close to me emotionally. But I'll say more about that uh, aspect in a little while. Now, June Fox Roberts was a 65-year-old divorcee and was very much a family woman. She had three children, Trisha, Sebastian and Abigail, and was a grandmother, and she loved having her family around her. Described as a kind-hearted and generous woman, she was a director of the family IT company and was considered an excellent baker, having run her own bakery company in the past. So, so she was the very epitome of a person who could be considered to have no known enemies. Now, June lived alone in a three-bedroomed home in Llantwit Vardra, a home she had lived in for 40 years. But her family were regular visitors to her home, and in fact one of her daughters was actually living with her temporarily following the breakdown of her marriage. On November the 19th, 2021, she dropped her daughters off at Ponticlean railway station as they were going to have a weekend away. And typically June was doing what she could to get them off to a good start for their weekend. She then returned home for a peaceful weekend. Unfortunately, it would end up being anything but Peaceful. Luke Dealey was a 24 year old student attending Cardiff University. By November of 2021, his mental health issues had been escalating for several years. In March of 2019, Dealey was admitted to a psychiatric facility for just short of a month after suffering an acute psychotic episode. At this point he was prescribed antipsychotic medication, but as with any medication regimen, the responsibility for sticking to the medication is down to the individual and those around them, though there is no information around whether Dealey was off his medication uh, at the time of the horrific incident I'm going to describe shortly. <clears throat> In July of 2021, Dealey's parents contacted the community mental health team with concerns around how he was presenting, uh, particularly with respect to his ongoing insomnia and his tendency to pace around endlessly. He attended the University of Cardiff starting in September of 2021 and moved into a shared 
student house in Roth. Almost immediately there were reports that his housemates found his behaviour challenging where he was said to keep the keys belonging to other residents uh, he would play his music extremely loud and apparently he also meddled with the alarm system in the home it seems that the last straw came on November the 11th when he had an altercation with a female housemaid where he threw water over her and called her a bitch and a see you next Tuesday. A complaint was lodged with the letting agent and the whole incident culminated in Dealey leaving the property without taking anything with him none of his belongings just the clothes on his back his behavior and whereabouts immediately following him leaving the property is very patchy in terms of definitive sightings and reports on november the 18th he was seen at the university campus in Treforest trying various doors of the student union. During this time a police search of his room at the shared house turned up a significant quantity of artworks that were described as demonic in nature. On November the 19th and 20th he was seen in the areas of Church Village and Llantwit Vardra and then on 21st of November he was seen on CCTV entering June's property at 49 St Anne's Drive at around 1.45 a.m. It's likely that his entering the house randomly at that time must have disturbed June Fox Roberts as there is evidence that she was in the hallway and when the subsequent attack began June was upright and she was noted to have suffered blunt force injuries to the head. Um, and these were inflicted while she was still alive, according to pathologist uh, Dr. Richard Jones. Now it seems the attack became more frenzied following these initial blows, but blessedly one of the initial blows seems to have rendered June unconscious with her falling to the ground though she did have fractures to her left arm which were indicative of defensive injuries but while prone on the ground she appears to have suffered stamping injuries now while she remained unconscious Dealey dragged June from the hallway into the dining room where he placed her on a tarpaulin and then he decapitated and dismembered the defenceless woman with an axe that was later found at the scene. Her limbs were placed into separate bags. He also brought a chainsaw into the property but he appears not to have used it during or after the assault. He appears to have left the property uh, around 2pm as he was later seen on CCTV 
at nearby Craigai Tyres at 2.20pm. Now it was around this time that June's daughter Abigail Shepherd, along with her friend Pamela Lovett, um, was becoming increasingly concerned that the regular contact that she had with her mother had stopped. So the girls decided to call at the home at St Anne's Drive to just check in with her and evidently they found the horrific grisly scene. When police analysed the crime scene they found and recovered yellow marigold gloves, the chainsaw I mentioned, a flash bottle of cleaning fluid, blue and silver tarpaulin, a bag for life containing clothing for Dealey, an axe and bloodstained tissue. There was evidence of a superficial cleanup of the scene, along with signs that Dealey had shaved and dyed his hair at the property. CCTV was later found showing Dealey talking and singing to himself at the location of the tyre depot. He was wrapped in a blanket and it seems he spent the night in a container at the site. He was subsequently arrested on November the 23rd. Ahead of the trial that was to follow, significant time was taken in psychiatric evaluations of Dealey. All three experts involved were unanimous in their opinion that Dealey's abilities to form rational judgments and exercise self-control were significantly impaired at the time of the attack. During the trial, the court heard of the impact of the murder on the family. Abigail Shepherd, who found her mother's body, said her life imploded on the day her mother was killed. She said she lived with her mother following the breakdown of her marriage and was in the process of putting the pieces of her life back together um, with her mother in a place I felt protected. Ms Shepherd added, I last saw mum on Friday the 19th of November when she dropped me off at Ponticlean train station as I was going to a friend's place in Gloucester for the weekend. I joked with mum about not having a party and trashing the house and we agreed I'd message on the Sunday. I felt happy knowing mum would have some time to herself and she was looking forward to pottering around at her own pace with the dog for company. 
The house that had been her family home since 1985. It was her safe place, her haven, the place where some of my fondest memories occurred. Nothing could have prepared me for what had happened and what I saw when I got home that Sunday. I close my eyes and see tarpaulin, my mother's nightdress, her leg cut at her thigh. These images will never leave me. My childhood home, my safe space, destroyed in the most violent act I have ever seen or could ever imagine. Abigail also described the ongoing trauma that she continues to experience, saying, I've undergone several courses of counselling to deal with the initial PTSD, and I have no doubt I will need further treatment. My anxiety and depression have been exacerbated and some days I struggle to get out of bed. I'm looking for a new home and I'm worried about the entry point to that home, about the neighbours' gardens, about the surrounding streets and areas not the usual buyer concerns like how pretty the kitchen is. I am terrified that something will happen to me and take me away from my daughter. I never want my daughter to have to endure what I have been through. She continued saying, I was a mummy's girl. She was my rock. We were so alike. And I catch myself saying things she used to say or using her mannerisms. I will never hear her laugh again. She laughed so much and it was infectious. There were so many things that I wish she had told me before she was taken away so violently and thoughtlessly. Mum had a difficult life and did not deserve this. Mum was preparing to retire, spend time with her grandchildren and her great-granddaughter that she never got to meet. She had big dreams of things she wanted to do in her retirement. Mum had started writing a book. She wanted to share her journey and the bumps she had along the way. All these stories that I will never here. My life will never be the same. My daughter's life will never be the same. We have been left with this gaping hole in our hearts. We've been victims of the most horrendous, violent crime. What may have been meaningless to Luke has devastated our family and left my heart shattered into pieces. June Fox Roberts' other daughter, Trisha Fox, was similarly deeply affected by her mother's death. 
I was told my mother had been killed and dismembered. My life was turned upside down and destroyed. She said she was unable to continue with her education in college and was left homeless. She said her mother's death left her feeling violated and her mental health had been enormously affected. She said my personality has changed and my way of life. I buried myself in work and pushed people away. It was like a work of fiction, a twisted horror movie. During the court case, in mitigation, David Elias KC said, no words can properly describe what Luke Daly did to June Fox Roberts and the anguish he caused to her family and friends. We have heard statements and everyone will have been greatly moved by them. Luke Daly's parents have written a long, dignified and well thought out letter on his behalf which encapsulates their feelings as his parents about what happened. An extract from the letter read, The case is disturbing, shocking and tragic and our hearts go out to her family. We cannot begin to imagine the grief they go through. We wake up every day wishing the situation was different for them, that their mother was alive and well. We are in despair about what has happened. Mr. Elias said Dealey was now a different man compared to the one who had killed Mrs. Fox Roberts. He said his client was incredibly ill at the time of the killing, which was the only explanation for what happened. He also said the defendant had chosen not to put the family of Mrs. Fox Roberts through a trial and he pled guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility. At the sentencing hearing on the 28th of April this year, Mr. Justice Griffiths, sentencing at Newport Crown Court, made Dealey subject to a hospital order under Section 37 of the Mental Health Act 1983, meaning he will be detained at a high security hospital. He was also made subject to special restrictions set out in Section 41 of the Act without limit of time. In his sentencing remarks, Mr. Justice Griffiths said, there is a high risk you will commit further serious offences if you are not detained. Detention is necessary to protect the public from serious harm. It's not possible to say how long that will be so. Mr Justice Griffiths went on to tell the court, 
the impact of Mrs. Fox Roberts' death and the manner of her dying on her family and friends has been set out in statements to the court. Addressing Dealey, Justice Griffith said, you only did these terrible things because of your mental illness. You have no previous convictions and there's no evidence that you had any rational motive for what you did. You thought you were receiving messages from what you described as a higher power and were acting on commands. You also had the delusional belief that there was a group of individuals out to get you. Upon the conclusion of the case, June Fox Roberts' family released a statement describing the loss and impact of that loss on the family. The statement read, On Sunday, November the 21st, 2021, our world imploded. June Fox Roberts was taken from us in a horrific way by a complete stranger. June was a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and loved spending time with her extended family. She adored her children uh, and grandchildren, and although she set high standards for us, she would do anything to support and encourage us. She spent many hours teaching her grandchildren various skills, including baking, gardening, knitting, and crafts, and telling them stories of the good old days from her childhood. June was so excited to meet her great-granddaughter, born earlier that month, but sadly, Luke snatched that chance from her. June was vibrant, extremely hardworking, determined, and very resilient after overcoming many challenges throughout her life. She had a varied career from running a chicken farm, helping disadvantaged children in schools, running a coffee shop, being an IT contractor, and as a landlady. June had friends around the world made from traveling through her work and was looking forward to retiring so she could spend more time with her friends and her family. She was never afraid of a challenge and lived life to the full every day. She had a wicked sense of humour and an infectious laugh. And June would always be quick to share her advice or experiences to help anyone around her. She was a traditional lady. She loved nature and to garden. Horse riding when she was younger, baking and her true loves were her German shepherds. She had many over the years, with her last faithful friend Aggie now being cared for by her daughters 
a June would want. June had a huge heart and would welcome anyone with open arms into her home. She was well known for not letting you leave her home or garden without a cup of tea or a glass of wine and a good natter first. And she was generous. If anyone had a problem, she would do anything in her power to help. Which makes it so much harder to accept that Luke could be so cruel to her for no reason. June was not afraid of death, but she wanted to die peacefully with her family around her. And Luke stole that from her and from all of us when he took her life years before her natural time. June had plans to build her dream bungalow to retire to and planned a beautiful garden and an allotment to escape to. Her children are continuing with June's garden in her memory and have been fortunate to receive donations from friends and family to help build June's dream through her GoFundMe. The family want to thank South Wales Police for their hard work in finding and apprehending Luke Dealey quickly. We are satisfied that this sentence is the best possible outcome for everyone. 2021, a call was received by South Wales Police from one of June's children, who with a close family friend had found June deceased inside her house in the most horrific of circumstances. Luke Dealey has pleaded guilty to manslaughter by diminished responsibility. A hospital and restriction order means that he will not be considered for release back into the community until it is deemed safe for him to do so. This has been a detailed and thorough investigation which has involved months of psychiatric evaluation alongside the criminal investigation. I would like to thank everyone who has assisted my team and I, which includes key witnesses, the wider Lantwick Vardra community and partners with whom we have worked on this case. Without everyone's support, the investigation would not have progressed so quickly for June's family who have waited so long and with such patience and dignity for answers as to how June came by her death. Throughout the investigation, June's family has been continuously supported by specially trained family liaison officers as we sought several experts to explain the injuries suffered by June. Whilst I appreciate that the answers we have been able to give them so far and today's sentence cannot bring back June, I do hope that our investigation and continuous support for June's family can bring them some closure and allow them to grieve with a greater understanding of what took place. Once met, June was never forgotten. She was a force of nature. June was our rock and our safe space and we will feel this loss for the rest of our lives. This was unquestionably a horrific crime which will have had massive ripple effects on the family, the community and beyond. But it's also unquestionably a tale of Luke Dealey's eroding mental health and descent into a significant and debilitating psychotic episode. I said earlier 
that this case had a significant emotional impact on me so I will explain why my brother was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia over 20 years ago and the change in him as a person was massive Before the episode which triggered his diagnosis, he was something of a bad lad. Impulsive with what would be described nowadays as ADHD. He had a reputation among his peers as a tough guy. But beneath that mask was a young man devoid of confidence. He drew his confidence from alcohol and illicit substances and it was the cumulative effect of these substances that seemed to have triggered his schizophrenia. I've seen first hand over 20 years of the impact of the diagnosis of the many medications tried and of his presentation since then. Rather than becoming completely detached, he has become more caring, but his fear, especially with more than one person in the room with him, is never far away. He practically lives as a hermit now, but he feels safe. Even though society is becoming more aware of mental health issues and the stigma around them is reducing, there remains a lack of real understanding of how these issues can impact on people and their lives. Schizophrenia has gone from being thought of as the illness of split personalities to a much more understood and recognised condition. But I feel there is still very little real empathetic understanding of, for, of what life is like for someone living with this condition. The following clip gives an indication of some of the sint symptoms of schizophrenia. Hello. Schizophrenia is a serious lifelong mental health condition affecting one in a hundred people. Schizophrenia is a type of psychosis and affects the way a person thinks, feels and behaves. People with schizophrenia are two to three times more likely to die early than the general population. And this is often due to preventable diseases such as heart disease, infections and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a group of conditions that increase a person's risk of heart disease, stroke and diabetes. And these include high blood lipids, high blood sugar, high blood pressure and obesity. We do not know the cause of schizophrenia. However, it is widely believed that people may be at increased risk due to their genetic makeup. And then the condition may be triggered by an environmental factor such as stress or drug use. Other risk factors include nutritional problems before birth, exposure to viruses before birth, living in poverty, living in a stressful environment, difference in volumes in specific parts of the brain and an imbalance in brain neurotransmitters. Schizophrenia occurs equally in men and women. In men, the mean age of onset is five years earlier than in women. Its onset is typically in late adolescence or early adulthood. And the age of onset is defined by when people have symptoms specific to schizophrenia. However, there's a prodromal phase between several months and years of non-specific symptoms, 
prior to the onset of the symptoms and signs of schizophrenia. These prodromal symptoms may include depression, anxiety, difficulties in concentrating, changes in thinking and perception, distrust, social withdrawal, lack of enjoyment in activities and general decline in functioning. The symptoms of schizophrenia generally fall into three different categories, positive or psychotic symptoms, negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. The positive or psychotic symptoms include delusions, hallucinations and thought disorder. Now a delusion is a fixed false belief that is out of keeping with a person's educational and cultural upbringing. And it is firmly held even when evidence to the contrary is given. Another psychotic or positive symptom is hallucinations where people may see, hear, smell, taste or feel something and it's very real to them but it it does not come from outside of their mind. This could be hearing voices or seeing something that's not there. And the third positive symptom is thought disorder, where the speech can be muddled or disorganised, or new words can be used that are made up. Negative symptoms are where somebody is not functioning at the level they were previously. These include loss of motivation, lack of interest in things that normally would interest them, social withdrawal, difficulty showing emotions, speaking less, a flat affect that somebody's face doesn't move so much with emotions to express emotions, difficulty planning and beginning and carrying on and finishing activities, lack of enjoyment in activities and difficulty functioning normally. Cognitive symptoms include difficulties with memory, attention and concentration. With some people in schizophrenia it's difficult to notice these but with others these difficulties become more prominent. They may affect somebody's ability to sustain a conversation remembering appointments or learning new things. People may experience difficulty processing information to make a decision, difficulty paying attention and focusing and problems using information immediately after learning it. Treatment for schizophrenia includes antipsychotic medication, psychological treatments such as cognitive behaviour therapy, other treatments such as coping strategies, behavioural skills training, supported employment and family education and support. Thank you for listening. Bye for now. Unless you've had experience of actually suffering the condition, it's difficult to put yourself in the shoes of someone suffering schizophrenia. But I feel it is very important to try. Imagine the feeling you get when you forget why you went into a room. Now take that feeling and extend it to all day, every day. And imagine try to live that life day to day with that discombobulating feeling and then add to that intrusive thoughts and also the feeling that there are a multitude of conspiracies against you. It is a massive and difficult load to carry. My aim in describing all of this is not to assuage Dealey's guilt in any way. What he did was horrific and abhorrent. Rather, I hope to shine a light on a poorly understood condition so we can begin to have a more thorough understanding of the turmoil in the head of a sufferer of schizophrenia. The world is undoubtedly a safer place with Dealey in a secure hospital. But I also hope that this hospitalisation sees him receive the medication and care that will help him understand and manage his condition more effectively. 
whether or not Dealey will ever be considered safe to re-enter society remains to be seen. What is clear is that the world lost a bright light with the attack on June Fox Roberts. The effects on her family have been clearly noted and they will continue to grieve and struggle to cope with her loss. This video is, of course, dedicated to this lovely woman who was a devoted mother and grandmother. No words can ever make up for the loss. So I just hope that time begins to allow this fractured family to move forward and that time also allows the community to begin to heal from this dreadful event. Thank you for watching another episode of Murder of Crows. I hope you will forgive me for straying into the personal impact of this case on me but I felt there were important things that I needed to say. I'm Steve with me as always is my feline paperweight Samson and we'll see you when we see you.